<clears throat> and welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us for this session. Uh, my name is Dr. Tim Baghurst. I'm the director of FSU Coach, the Interdisciplinary Center for Athletic Coaching at Florida State University. The purpose of this session is to talk about resiliency, resiliency amongst student athletes, amongst students, but also amongst coaches and, and teachers, because it's a, a real, not only issue, but also something that, that school districts are concerned about as well. I've been joined by three special guests who are going to be the ones contributing to this panel. I'm going to, to let them briefly introduce themselves. I'll be the host for this session asking the, the questions. So uh, just sit back, relax and, and enjoy. And I hope you, you take something from this. So Tessa, uh, why don't you start with yourself? Just a, a brief introduction of where you are, uh, where you work, who you coach and, and a little bit of your background. My name is Tessa Taylor, and I coach cross country and track at Frostproof Middle Senior High School in Central Florida, and um, I coach 6th through 12th graders. Because we are a combination school, we don't have separate middle school sports, so if a 6th, 7th, or 8th grader wants to participate in track and cross country, they are on the high school team with me. Um, prior to working in Frostproof, I ran um, Division I track and cross country at Furman University in Greenville, South Carolina. And I also was an assistant coach there for a couple of years before taking a break from coaching to raise my family. Thank you, Tessa. Justin. Hi, good evening. My name is Justin Shipp. I'm the head varsity coach at Olympia High School here in Orlando, Florida. Uh, this is my first year as varsity coach at Olympia. Prior to that, I uh, worked at Windermere High School as well as Dr. Phillips High School. I've had the privilege to coach all ages of kids, um, basketball, football, whatever it may be. Uh, I'm looking forward to um, talking and, and learning tonight from these other coaches. Thank you. Adam? My name is Adam Chamberlain. Um, I work at Jennings Middle School in Hillsborough County, Florida. I coach track and field. I teach PE. And my previous experiences from collegiate to pro in strength and conditioning and uh, architecture. Okay, thank you, everybody. So we're talking about resiliency today. And when we think about resiliency, we may all have different definitions to that. And so I, I'm going to give you a, a definition or two just to give you perspective as to what we're referring to. Resiliency itself can be defined as the capacity to withstand or recover quickly from difficulties. Um, some may interpret it as, as toughness. Uh, we may hear terms such as, as grit as another example or synonym of this. Um, other definitions, the ability of a substance or object to spring back into shape. So it's, it's that concept of elasticity where something happens to us and we rebound and recover quickly from it. Okay, so let's start with the first question. The, the way this format's going to work, I'm not going to ask all of you to answer each question, but if you feel like you want to, to lead or, or have a response, then feel free. Hopefully this is a, an organic conversation rather than one that's, that's scripted. So question one, how do you incorporate strategies for building resilience into your coaching practices? Do you have any examples of how you do this? I'll go first. Um, I would say building up the tasks that the kids are doing, because when they come in with little or no attention to like the tasks within sport, they're mm -hmm. always spinning around or looking around, uh, not really like there in the moment, building it by almost, you know, a metric. Okay, for 60 seconds, I got to keep their attention today. Uh, next week, we'll go to 90 instead of like first day bringing kids in and yelling at them every 15 seconds because their attention is pulled away and kind of treating it like you wouldn't weight training, increasing the dosage of attention and resiliency that you need little by little and then just acknowledging it's not going to happen overnight. One of the things that I try to do is make sure the kids have um, understand that they are valued outside of the sport, that I care about them as a person 
and care about them, whether or not their performance is good or not, because I think it's a lot easier to be resilient and go through hard things if your identity is not completely tied to your performance in a sport. Um, I agree. I mean, with the other coaches, I, I agree um, for building resiliency in the kids, um, just understanding that they're more than just whatever the box score says, I think, um, like Tessa mentioned, is very is great. It works. Uh, you build the relationships with the kids and you get to learn more about them. And I think it takes the pressure off them um, and it'll help them be resilient because they understand that you care about them as a person and they're going to make shots, miss shots. But um, if they persevere and strive through things that, you know, there's, they're going to come out on the other side. Okay. So let me be uh, a little bit more specific then you you're working with a student athlete, you know, that they're capable of extending themselves beyond what they're currently doing. Oftentimes that's physical. Right. We're expecting, no, you can, you can do this. I can't coach. I can't, it's too hard. I, I mean, anybody who's a parent has probably heard those words. And how do we, in that moment, encourage that resiliency without being too forceful without, while recognizing they do have limits as, and maybe they can't do it. And we're not becoming this, some kind of, punisher uh, of of student athletes how do we what words do we use what how do we we get that athlete to really do something that that maybe they don't think they can do i i think uh if i could go first on this one i think if you understand their goals and let's say their goal is to win a state championship is something in sports whatever it may be and in that moment if you're coaching them and you're like we're trying to win a state i know you're tired I know you've been through it. I know things are hard, but like right now, the state championship, like this moment right now, if we can lock in right now and get through this moment, like this is going to help us in, like for us, it's Lakeland. And that's a huge focus for us. So I think, you know, I, I, I'm, that, that's what I've personally used before to try to motivate them and not just be like, oh, you're soft and this, like that doesn't work. <laughs> you, you have to find, you have to know the player and you have to know the strings to pull so they can reach their goals. You have to help them reach their goals. And you have that information. I think in um, distance running specifically, one of the things I have to be aware of is like how conditioned are they? So I have to know when to push them and know when is too much because I don't want to injure a young athlete who isn't um, physically ready for the challenge. But that being said, one of the things that I tell my athletes is a lot of times our bodies can do a lot more than our minds are sometimes telling us. I tell them it's this alarm bell. So when it gets tough and it hurts, you have this alarm bell that starts going off in your head saying, stop, you can't do this. But a lot of times you can do that. And I encourage them to push through that alarm bell. And the more they do that, the more they realize like, I can do this. My head's telling me to stop, but my body does know what to do and I can keep going. Okay, next question. What are some common challenges you're seeing amongst the athletes you're working with? And how do you help develop coping strategies to, to deal with them? And a lot of times I'm guessing these challenges are not necessarily specific to, to the actual sport they're playing. They may be challenges that occur outside of that sport. And in many ways, coaches are, are counselors in that respect. So what are you seeing and, and how do you help? Okay. Um, oh yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Well, um, I mean, with kids, I think the resiliency is in the attention first, because uh, it, it with most athletes that come out, they have no attention span, and on day one, they're already wondering about the last day and not the work they have to put in the next day. Um, it seems they're really into that instantaneous. When are the when are the track meets? What do we get if we win? And uh, you know, I'm at a Title I school, so a lot of the kids in our sports, it's not strange at halftime of a basketball game for kids to turn out missing because they went home because they weren't okay with losing. And it's um, 
it's unfortunate because most of the kids you make them do just general running or something and it's either like with sarcasm or they're serious like this is child abuse so it's almost maybe they know they're think they know they're right uh they don't think they have to work hard they just think when i'm tired of doing it i'm done and as a coach you don't have any kind of you know ground to stand on because everyone's afraid of you know saying the wrong thing or making the kid work a little too hard there's no gray area it's either on or off and it's when you limit the coaches you limit the product that they're putting out most times and that seems to be it like there's just attention span and being able to be in the moment for a full practice and think that really went well without thinking about the game in uh or the match in five days when that's really all they're focused on is the end result and not the work that goes into it i have kind of a different take on it for me personally uh the challenges that i see for my players i feel like there are two i think one of them um and probably you know it's parents um, and then the other one, you know, which is very important is situation. And you have to understand, you know, per kid, what's, what's the deal. Um, I think parents can be a big problem for kids, like kids worrying about wanting to make their parent happy, um, or the parent coaching them from the stands. Um, and that's sometimes conversations I have to have with the parents. Um, and, and talk to them about what's best for their kid. Understand it's a partnership. We're working for their kid. And then situations, you know, like it's great, for instance, now at, at school, you know, there's free food for um, the kids at lunch. Like that's, it seems like a little thing, but it's a huge thing. Um, you know, some kids, are, the nutrition, like their situation, like based off their situation or even not, like nutri being nutrition and eating the right foods and and being healthy and, and supplying and fueling your body. Um, I think those are the things that I see challenges with. And, um, you know, we've tried to partner with some local places around here to get kids some of the food, like when it's going to be thrown away, like the ready-made food and stuff like that. Um, um, and then, of course, they're able to have free breakfast and free lunch, which is which is outstanding. And then, you know, we work with the parents to, to, to try to provide peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, like for a few of our stuff over the summer, my parents were amazing and made food for the kids. And, and um, so that was great. So those challenges are what I'm seeing right now. Parents, number one, probably, and then situation. I think um, one of the challenges that I face, I, I face some of the same ones you guys were talking about is consistency. A lot of my athletes play multiple sports at the same time, but they expect to be really good at all of them at the same time. And I think it's great that they're playing multiple sports. Um, I think early specialization often robs kids of experiences and studies show that it doesn't really predict that they're going to be great elite athletes one day anyways, but sometimes they'll be playing two or three sports at the same time and they're exhausted and they're not consistently going to either practice. And then they want to know how to get better. And it's hard because I'm like, well, if you want to get better. You need to be more consistent. <laughs> yeah. We, we talked about the fact that coaches are often the, at the forefront of support systems in place for, for student athletes. And, and I'm curious, one, can, can you give examples of the kind of things that athletes can and do share with you? And two, how did you create an environment where the athletes felt comfortable enough to talk to you about those things? Because if they don't trust you, if they don't respect you, they're not going to come to tell you, as Justin alluded to, hey, I'm, I'm really hungry. I haven't eaten today kind of kind of situation. Or I've got something going on at home that's that's really affecting my my ability to to practice today. How do you create that environment? Are there anything specific that you do? And secondly, uh, give some examples of some of the things that coaches in general may be faced based on your experiences. One of the things that I've built into our practices just to help have time to get to know the athletes better and spend some time talking 
is at the end of practice every day, we all gather on mats and the athletes do core, which we only have three mats, so they have to take turns. So we're all in this one group sitting around talking. And those aren't necessarily the times when the athletes tell me something really serious, but it's time when the hard workout is done. We're doing core and stretching. Not everybody has something to do, but they can't leave yet. And it makes for a good time to have conversations. And then I try to remember those things and then ask like, oh, how did, you know, the test go? Or how was the, um, the 4-H fair that you went and showed your cow at? Or try to remember things from them. So I find that once you build in, build in a time when you can actually like talk to the athletes, then they're more likely to come and share things with you. And kids tell me stuff about hard things at home, um, parents getting divorced, um, some of them talk about, um, I haven't really had anyone tell me about abuse per se, but like some of them tell me about like pretty, pretty tough things that they're going through and it can be hard. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know at our school, um, like I said, we're title one, most of the kids, it's not a great area. They always know someone who's being shot or whatever. Uh, most of my kids I have in physical education, and then they do sports after school. So I coach where I teach. And so I have a, a decent amount of access to kids that need something and let it be known. Generally, we'll push them on, on the track or something to get extra time with them. And, uh, you know, it's always really horrendous stuff. I mean, Probably a quarter of our students' parents are in jail. Um, we have a lot of kids who are in foster care. So there's a lot of that to go around. Um, as a coach, I'm kind of more stern than most of the teachers. So verbally, the kids don't do much or say much, but it's how they act. Like kids normally just keep their distance, but when they get comfortable and they trust you, then they start touching you and leaning on you when there's, you know, people just hanging out. Uh, there's a lot of nonverbal cues that I think is very interesting because verbally, you know, I push my students and our excitement is more intense than normal. Uh, most people just clap and jump up and down. We get like, hey, that's where we want to be. Let's push more. Um, so knowing where you're at and where you're coming from, I feel like it's a different world for me to see that side of people because it's always been professional sport so they're not going to come to you they're going to go to a therapist or something like that but kids it's totally different um so it definitely changes and opens up by the end of like any semester even three months with a kid you won't even recognize them uh because they were just trying to get attention the wrong way first for some reason they do that and then by the end they're realizing i don't have to act out to get this person's attention and uh Hopefully it'll help. Um, I haven't taught that long that I have a ton of experience to compare them, but from last year to this year, um, it's totally different because I'm changing the way I interact. And, you know, I spend more time asking kids what's wrong and letting them know if there is something wrong and can talk to me. You never expect them to do it. And then a week later, they're at your door asking if they can talk to you alone. Um, so it's pretty interesting. Um, for myself personally, there are a couple of things that I've done. I mean, one is just, you know, every day just saying good morning, saying hello <clears throat> and building the, you know, just getting to know the kids, saying good morning, ask questions, um, team building stuff, doing silly things like two truths and a lie. You're going to learn something about somebody. If you guys can go bowling, if you can play a game in the classroom, um, we played taboo before we've done 20 questions. Um, just you you learn things more about the kids um, and listen and ask them questions. And and like to your point, I think it's great, you know, when we let the kids know, hey, if you ever, you know, you need to talk to me, like, let me know. Like, I'm here for you. Um, you know, I think that's kind of our role, right? It's a it's a community of people that are raising our, our student athletes. And so if every you know everyone has to do their role and so my role is just to try to make the kids feel comfortable um get to know stuff about each other so they'll have fun um because they usually like the same type of things and are usually all kind of the same silly and um you know i think they just take it over from there 
when next next question then we we live in a, a society where winning is in in many ways everything and we're expected to succeed and we're expected to to have a great season that that's marked by success on on some kind of balance sheet and yet we have athletes who will not be that successful we have teams who will not be successful and, and think about it 50 percent of of competition and it has a losing record in that sense if you if you go up against other people and and so we have this environment where we were expected to win but a lot of times athletes don't win coaches don't win and there's that pressure there to be successful within this realm of well we're supposed to be developing children we're supposed to be setting a great example we're supposed to be offering life skills so how do you how do you do that within a framework of maybe you are trying to win which why not that's a good thing right i see justin smiling winning is good <laughs> but also recognizing that we're trying to develop these athletes and push them through hard times where we could win if you were willing to sacrifice a little bit more whether it's time effort mental uh, toughness, whatever it may be. So how do you balance that winning with it's all right, don't worry about it. It's only, it's just a game. So, so my first year coaching at Frostproof, at the end of cross country season, I was supposed to turn in our record. So all these cross country meets we go to have multiple schools. So I'm going through and counting, like we beat three teams and five teams beat us. And I turned in this record at the end. And the athletic director said, oh, no, you only get a win if you beat everybody. So our record ended up being zero, I think, my first season. Because oh. <laughs> you had to beat everybody to get a win. Um, kind of put things in perspective for me. But one of the things that I have not done from the beginning, but I've done the past couple years, is I've started off the season with a parent and athlete meeting where we go over um, our team values, our code of conduct, and all of these things. So I set the foundation at the beginning of the season saying that my personal goals for the team is that I want all my athletes to be healthy. I want them to learn to enjoy running and I want them to experience self-improvement. And that's something that every single person on the team can accomplish. And then I tell them, I want to know your personal goals too, but this is my goal for the team. And I feel like that has really helped and like set the stage of not, I don't have parents coming and complaining to me about like if their kids running varsity or if their kids were running JV or things like that, because I think it's really helped to, they know where I'm coming from and what my philosophy is. So if somebody's a win at all costs person and they, they'll just probably go somewhere else because they know I'm not going to win at all costs, even though we like to win. And well, that being said, uh, generally the short time, like I said, I've had with kids, I kind of isolate the kids who would probably beat themselves up more than I ever could and bring them on because the fire is there. And a lot of kids, they just, any level of intensity or raising the voice, they don't want any of it. Um, so it's kind of with a short season in middle school, to get the wrong kid and then he quits because he doesn't like the intensity of the practices. Um, we only get one practice. If you lose your first meet, your season's over. So we only have three. Um, so the kids that come out, we don't want to take spots from kids that really want it because we don't have time to rectify it. If you're in eighth grade and you finally first time ever making the track team and we only have one meet, I got to pick the right people. Um, there's no exploratory situation about it because the school only has so much for so many coaches and you know when you have a hundred kids and you're one person you you can only teach them so much so fast so them already you know coming with that downloaded mentality of winning means everything because that's how a lot of kids are now they watch they think kobe bryant did everything in one day um you can find kids like that. And that's kind of what I go by. It's probably not the best philosophy, but in the current state, if you're motivated and I mean, these kids, they don't run fast. They like jump on the ground and start 
wailing their fist. It's, it's strange, but um, the kids who are really competitive kind of, you know, they got it from the kids that aren't very competitive. Now there's no middle ground. And those are the kids I just grab. Um, there are a couple of things I, when it comes to like that fine line and pushing things, it, I think it's just maybe a con for me, it, a consistency in standards so everyone understands kind of what's the expectation and and then it's you know you on you as a coach that you have to be consistent with all the players on you know holding them accountable and everybody has to see it and you have to you have to show everyone because um if, if you don't you're not gonna not everyone is gonna be bought in but when player a and player b are treated you know held to the same standard as player c and d and as long as you're I think when you're communicating to them and they know everything and there's no secrets and stuff like that, that, you know, that's how you can push the line. And, you know, when you don't win, cause you're not going to win all the time, you know, it's tough. Um, you, you want to make sure that they know it's okay to feel how they're feeling and they should kind of, they should kind of embrace this feeling right now and, and, and let it, let it help them think about things and, and let it help them motivate them on times when they're tired and, and whatever it is. But, but, um, oh, sorry about that. Um, but it, it is a very fine line. Justin, you mentioned, we're, we're moving on to the next question. You mentioned parents being, can be challenging. And in some ways they can also be very supportive when we talk about resiliency and grit, et cetera. We can have the parent that you tell me what you need coach. And you know, my kid will, I'll make sure my kid does it at home, which may or may not be a good thing. We also have the parents who are just, yay, you're going to babysit my child so that I can go do X, Y, and Z. And hopefully you take good care of them and they have a good time. And, you know, it's, it's okay if they don't give their best because, Maybe the parent is thinking more about their own needs rather than their child's needs. Hmm. I'm not speaking from experience at all. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the truth is that the parents are a, a massive influence on their child's, their, their children. Um, some will say that the coach is the most influential person in an athlete's life, but clearly parents are too. So how do we get parents on board whereby we're trying to work on your child's personal growth. It's uncomfortable. They don't want to come to practice tomorrow because it was hard today. But you need that parent to buy in that this is important. The parent has to agree with the coach rather than the child. How, how, do, you, how do you do that? Uh, you know, Tessa, I'll start with you just because you talked a little bit about parent meetings at the beginning. I'm guessing this is part of that, right? Yes. Sorry. I was on mute. Um, yeah. So I think having c communication with the parents from starting in the beginning is really helpful. Um, I have the parent meeting, but I'm also, we um, have like a messaging system. So I'm making sure the parents know what's going on. And I do not naturally like confrontation, but I've learned that if there's something going on with a kid, that it is better if I don't wait. And I just call the parent and be like, Hey, this has been going on and keeping that communication open 99% of the time, the parents like, thank you so much for calling me. And it can be hard to do, but I think it's worth it. And especially since I have many young athletes, I find that a lot of times I have to call more actually for the older athletes because <laughs> the younger ones are more apt to do just whatever I say and toe the line. But when they get a little bit older, that's when they maybe get a little bit more rebellious. But if I built this relationship with the parents over the past few years, when their kids were younger, when something does happen, they usually trust me and know that I care about their kid. And that's why I'm calling them. If, if I could just piggyback off Tessa, I think, I mean, she, she hit it. I mean, just confronting it, being up, going and talking to the parent, trying to get them to understand that, that we're a team for your, you know, we want the best for your child. Like, so we're a team. So any communication that we can have, um, you know, together and get a better understanding for each other. I mean, at the end of the day, that makes those car rides um, enjoyable <laughs> as opposed to it could be pretty adversary. So 
Um, I think it's just like Tessa said, like as coaches, we have to go. That communication is important. I've been sending out like communication emails to my parents, like, hey, this is what we're doing this week. This is what we're working on. Um, reflections from like we've done some fall league games, ref reflections from the fall league games so they can kind of see what I'm thinking and where I'm at. Um, and it gives them a chance to, you know, reach out to me right then via email if there's something going on. Um, I always encourage the kids that it's important for them to be the ones that kind of advocate for themselves, not just, for, you know, because it's me, but going through in life. So um, that, that, that's pretty much it. Adam, anything to add? Uh, no, I'm good. And they said it pretty well. I, I want to transition a little bit now into you as coaches. Um, coaches, well, the number one thing I'm asked to speak about is stress and burnout in coaches. And and one may assume, therefore, that coaches themselves may don't maybe don't have the resiliency that they should. And I, I think that's a, a mistake. I think coaches in general have high levels of resiliency, most of whom have been an athlete of some kind themselves and, and experienced challenges. The problem is, is as we talked about resiliency, do you bounce back from situations? And I'm curious if, if you're willing, give an example of something where you as a coach experienced some kind of stressor that really tested your resiliency and, and maybe even questioned, hey, do I want to do this? Um, is this for me? Should Is it worth it? Um, because I think if, if we as coaches are able to share those more openly, there may be opportunities to, to almost learn from each other on what does and doesn't work in terms of bouncing back from those challenges. I'll go first because you just reminded me of a great first week at a community college. Um, had a baseball team, and I told them it was two horrible events in the first week. So I told them all, hey, go to the bookstore and get some milk. You know, we need protein after a workout. One of the kids was lactose intolerant, and he did it anyway. Uh, so his father called me, and um, I got a good earful. And then another kid, his father told him, baseball players don't do bench press. So when I told him he wasn't going to play because he wasn't going to do weights, his father called me and, uh, you know, his triple a career lasted a good three months and, uh, he was a pro for the rest of his life. So yeah, the resilience, at, and that was my first week. And I'm just like, well, if kids can just say no, where do I, you know, where do I go from here? Because I was, I was young also when I started with strength and conditioning. So I think 99% of the time it's great. And then that 1%, you start to question yourself. Uh, I was, you know, still dealing with people in the pro level when I decided to stop because they all had private coaches and private massage therapists. And no matter what you said, it was wrong. Like they thought, oh, I, I do CrossFit on my off time. And my CrossFit guy says, you don't know anything. And you're just like, how do you argue with that? Uh, so you, it's kind of nearsighted because most strength coaches were locked into a head coach. And if they clear out a program, you're gone too. So in coaching, yeah, everybody wants to be a strength coach. So I feel like it's a little bit uneasy and it makes you, I know a lot of strength coaches within the first year or two, they they change careers. They're a realtor now or something like that. So <laughs> the traction is just, you have to want it. It's kind of like looking for athletes. You want them to want it a little bit more than you. You want running to be effortless, not looking like the kid is being attacked, you know, by a zombie. There's certain things you look for. And like with resilience, those kids that want to do right already, they're half taking care of the problem for you. So they're not going to do anything stupid to injure themselves. They want to play. They want to, you know, drink the milk and do the extra reps. Um, and they make coaching easy. Everyone's had kids like that. And I think 
that fair mix of kids being in the flow state um, where it's not stressful. Again, most times, I guess people coach after school, they've already worked a full day. So yeah, I can, I know coaches that hop around and resiliency seems like a problem, but I think it might be just professional uh, development. They're not where they should be, but you know, end all end. Yeah. There's, but uh, there's a, or doing something I love doing, it's the times I've questioned it are more than I'd like to admit. It, if I could add, I think it's interesting. If I could just make a comment about what you said, like the kid that was, you know, lactose. It, I, I it's funny because it's it goes back to like the parents. So for me, the way I'm the way my head is thinking on it, it's like, why would the kid think it would not be okay to tell you? that he was lactose intolerant, like, does the, does the parent at home, is the kid not allowed to say anything and talk back and do anything? And then the fact that the parent called, I would be like, whoa, like, that's just crazy to me. Um, but maybe I'm making a big deal about it. But um, stressors, as far as the stressor thing, um, Dr. Baghurst, I mean, I think it's our job. Like, we're all going to have personal stuff going on in our lives. Everyone does. No one knows what people have going on but it's my duty and my responsibility. I can't let that interfere with the kids. I have to put that stuff aside and they still got to get me. I still have to be there for them. And then it's usually not the kids or the players that are stressing that, that are putting the stressor, like the players that I'm working with, you know, it might be uh, administration or certain parents or something, but it's not really the kid. And so it's hard to, you know, you have to remind yourself of that but it's almost like our duty that we have to just kind of be like, all right, move this over here for now, move this over here for now. Like I have these kids right now at this practice. I'm all in with them. We are here right now. Um, and then when you're still spending that time with them, like, you know, if they come and have lunch with you or whatever it is, like you still have to be locked in and giving them everything you got. And then, you know, you hop in the car and you drive, you know, you, you get back on the road and now you pick your stuff back up and you do, you do what you got to do. And maybe you, you need to go handle that better. Or, you know, maybe you need to confront it like Tessa was talking about earlier with the parents. Um, I'd say I'm going to be careful. I don't want to share too much because a lot of this happened recently in my coaching job and I don't want to throw anyone under the bus. But last year, around this time, I was really close to burnout. And I think two things were contributing to it. Um, one was I was taking a sports psychology class and was working on the skill of being more assertive. And I probably bit off more than I could chew in being more assertive in many areas. And um, one of the things is with having athletes play multiple sports, I decided I was going to be more assertive just in working with other coaches and scheduling like practices and games. And that ended up being really stressful because not everyone really wanted to work with me. Some would rather just try to force their athletes to only come to their practice on the side and not really go to cross country. So that was stressful. And then I also found that for some of my athletes, I wanted success for them more than they wanted it for themselves. And I finally came to a point where I realized that like, I can't want it for them more than they want it for themselves. I can't change that inner drive, their intrinsic motivation. I can encourage them the best that I can, but at the end of the day, I can't lose sleep over an athlete that doesn't want it. And um, so anyways, all that saying, there are lots of things that contribute from administrative things and scheduling and even just dealing with individual athletes. But some great advice that I had was one was um, to le like leave it at practice or to have somebody besides just my family members to talk it with, talk about it with. Because I, for a while, I was just going home and telling my husband about every single thing that stressed me out. And he was great. But then I started like burdening him and weighing him down with everything that was stressing me out. <laughs> so finding other people that I can talk to, or just realizing there's some things that like, I just need to let it go, leave it at practice. It's not worth stressing about. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges coaches have is doubling down, which is where things maybe aren't going the way you want them to go. There's situations that aren't uh, how you wanted to foresee them happen. And as a consequence, you work harder. You, you put more time in, you give more of your, your energy. 
it's a real danger for coaches in particular. And I'm wondering if you do have any ways to de-stress, to get away from the, I've just got to push through it. I've just got to show grit. I've just got to be mentally tough for all of those around me, recognizing that that's not always possible. How do you, how do you get away from it all? Do you have any methods? Do you do anything? Or is this a, maybe a, even a wake up call of, yeah, that's me. I need to figure something out. I mean, one of the things that I still do is exercise myself. I mean, first thing in the morning after my kids go to school, before I start my work is I usually go for a run. And on days when I skip it, I can tell that um, I needed it, not because I necessarily needed to get faster or some achievement, but it's because I mentally needed that time to go for a run. Um, but I also usually try to set um, some time aside to spend with my husband where we're not talking about work or doing something where we're doing something we both enjoy, whether we're going hiking or paddle boarding or doing something like that. Those are two things I try to do every week. <laughs> I'm with Tessa, like on the working out um, two, three times a week. Uh, I love the sun. So, the, you know, you get to that point and it's like, I, I need sun. So whether it's going out for a walk or just being out by the pool, going to the beach, um, just getting sun just seems to rejuvenate me. And um, and then, of course, like taking walks and and listening to podcasts, those kind of things, those also help kind of recharge me um, and keep me going. I think with the kids. I have, I'm very lucky that, I, again, I see them during the day and there's always a bunch of them around. So if they're the ones causing the stress through coaching or whatever, I hang out with other kids and just let them be themselves because the kids that, that you coach, they'll always be different around you. And they try to be the best version of themselves, which sometimes gets boring. Um, you just hear the right things from them and that's it. But the normal kids, the stuff they have to say is absolutely ridiculous in the middle school level. But just like you get some levity hanging out with them and, uh, you know, not really dumbing it down a little bit. But I don't know half of the things they're talking about that are going on in the world and the terms and things like that. And it's hilarious to me to listen to them. And I've never gotten up and been like, man, I really shouldn't have done that. It's always you know, we're all sad to see each other go. And it's a weird coping me mechanism for me because I'm not really a kid person. But now that they're my responsibility, it kind of changed it for me. But um, yeah, I mean, different little groups can definitely, they're always readily available if I'm at school. And yeah, they just, the stuff they say and do, um, it, it's a good way to cope with it because I can flip it immediately. Okay, we're about to wrap up. So let me ask you to give me one sentence. And we've been talking about resiliency in, in, in ourselves. We've talked about resiliency in student athletes. So if you could offer one piece of advice to, to other coaches, and it's, it's one sentence, what would it be? I didn't prep you for any of these, which is fantastic. <laughs> now you got to come up with it. I would say be patient and trust yourself. Okay. I'd say love the kids and do your best, but don't expect yourself to be or them to be perfect. Man. Can I just say, um, I, I don't know, Tim. Um, I mean, lead like Tessa said, like lead with love and just be consistent in your standards and just be you. Excellent. Well, thank you all very much for contributing. Um, if somebody does have a question, you know, watching this and, and wants to get in touch, maybe follow up with something, how can they reach you? What's the best way? Email, I'm guessing. Yes. Email for me. Okay, would you just mind just sharing your email address verbally? Mine is tessa.taylor at gmail.com. So it's T-E-S-S-A 
dot taylor t a y l o r at gmail. I'll go next. Uh, nine, the number nine, Chamberlain, C H A M B E R L A I N, the number nine at gmail.com. I feel like this is a dating video. <laughs> <laughs> um, my email is justin.ship at ocps.net. So it's J U S T I N dot S H I P P at ocps.net. Net. All right. Thank you. And of course, my name's Tim Baghurst, T Baghurst at FSU.edu. Thank you everybody for watching. Thank you, Tessa, Justin, and Chamberlain for joining me. I hope it's been of great benefit. Thanks. Thank, thank, thank you, you, everybody.